Hi everybody, it's Danny Sure. Welcome to Musical Mondays. This is exciting. I'm here with my co-writing partner Rick Chafe here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And today we're going to give you a step-by-step -step about how we adapted the stage musical strike to the movie musical stand. So stick around to the end of the video because we're going to give you the whole lowdown. So here we go. So first, welcome Rick. Let's take it back to the beginning. 2000, what is it? Or when uh, Rick first became involved in the project. He'll tell you all about it. Um, okay, so I had nothing to do with the first draft of this, of the, of the play. Uh, that was entirely Danny's creation and Danny called me up and uh, he'd written a couple of musicals at this point and could you give me some notes on it? So I came to see you put on a workshop production of it and it was it, it was like a quantum leap from your first two musicals that, as far as I could see. Uh, Everything I know about writing plays better. Right. <laughs> so, but uh, but what was going on in it was like first of all this great story of this of the general strike. It's a, this massive story, but you wove together what was happening on the world scene in Europe with uh, the post World War situation, uh, immigration, all of these different layers of society were all woven into it in about five or six. Uh, plot lines, which is a really sophisticated thing to do, it very difficult to do, and it had great songs. So, I gave you about five pages of notes. I read them all to you in a coffee shop, and <laughs> yeah, I remember you said, "I'll send you a few notes overnight." I think it was eighteen pages. <laughs> okay, well, it was a lot. And uh, and then you said, "That's great." Uh, now you have to do the rewrite, Rick, because I have to go raise three hundred thousand dollars to put That's this right. on at the local stage, Rainbow Stage. And, and, and well, the I director involved in our original stage production at Rainbow Stage, Anne Hodges, also from Winnipeg, she said, just let Rick handle it. Trust me, it'll be better. And a beautiful partnership resulted ever since. So we've written it and rewritten it. And that's one thing. M musicals are never written. They're rewritten. I, I can't count the number of times we've redone it into different adaptations. <laughs> yeah, we were always reworking it for every production we had, but also for radio, for a, for different versions. But when we when we came to rewrite it as a screenplay, then we went through another ten, twelve drafts. Yeah, right. So it's you know it, it it's probably about a fourteen year journey yeah. from the, that first workshop to seeing it on screen. So we're going to give you a step-by-step -step of what we did, hopefully inspire you with your journey. Our particular journey is adapting a stage musical. Writers are not often asked to adapt their own work, be it play or novel, into a movie, but we just did it because <laughs> I was the producer. Yeah. No uh, permission required. Yeah. yeah. So we worked with two really great story editors from Toronto, Ken Chubb, shout out to Ken, and from Winnipeg, Aaron Kim Johnston, who's a great writer and director, most notably of Russell Crowe's first right. ever lead role for the moment. Check that movie out if you ever have a chance. So director Ann Hodges first clued me into the concept of stage time versus screen time. And I've never seen any writing about this or videos on YouTube. There's a psychological process that's different in humans, when we watch a live person on stage, our, our neurons were developed over the course of evolution to vibe on someone live mm. speaking to us and that interaction that live theater is. And so I first noticed when you're watching a stage show, you can watch someone do a speech for five minutes mm. and it doesn't seem very long. Whereas the first thing you have to know about adapting from stage to screen is 30 seconds feels like an eternity on screen. So this two hour beautiful stage musical that we had all of a sudden got shrunk down to almost nothing. Cause remember Ken Chubb said, you know that five page speech? Well, you got to make that five <laughs> lines. Yeah. Like all things in screenwriting and theater, uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a true thing and a rule. But there also are no rules. So, at the same time that um, you will find in screenplays on in movies that the scenes are much shorter or they're broken up or they'll move from one room to another room to another room to make them feel as if there's there's more flow and more things happening on stage. 
you can have a 45 minute first act that all takes place in the same living room and the cheat that they do in reverse that we do in theater is there's really 14 scenes going on in there every time somebody enters or leaves it's called a french scene but each one of those is a unit of action mm. well in in the, a movie you generally move those around and break them up but the the first scene of uh, of the social network, eight minutes long, two people in a restaurant. The, the, there's a middle scene in Parasite, this year's Oscar winner for best director, or best director, best movie, best screenplay. There's an eight minute scene right in the middle of it, dead middle. Uh, the great new movie, my favorite new movie this year is Vast of Night. It opens with probably a 25 minute long scene. It's got wow. a scene in the middle that's 15 minutes long of one person, a telephone operator. We just watch her doing her job while she's taking calls. So. All the, all the rules, they ain't rules. But it is the first thing that we, we did. We, right. we started breaking up the, uh, the scenes into, um, into more uh, fluidity. And that's what we were working on in Draft After Draft, actually, right. trying to get the flow of this thing to all work as a movie. It was Ken Chubb that first laid the heavy on us, as story editors sometimes do with writers. Again, general rule of thumb, original writers, it's kind of frowned upon that they do the adaptation. But I remember the first tough sort of hammer from the uh, story editor was that lead character that you have can't be the lead character anymore. So in the uh, stage play, the, the, or at least the original version of it, Mike, uh, he's a 50 year old man uh, and he was dead center. Like he's, he's the, st the center of the entire story. Everything revolves around him and the young lovers are, are like a, a romantic subplot. Uh, so Ken said, no, you, like old people go to a movie about young people, but young people won't go to a movie about old people and they're <laughs> your primary market. So you've got to yeah. take the romantic leads and move them to the front. So we moved to Stefan, yeah. uh, Mike's son, or he was a godson at the time. That was the second thing oh, I yeah. forgot about this. That's right. He, he can't be a, his godson. It's not a close enough relationship. Right. Make him his son. So yeah. we, there was a lottery writing around that. But uh, it was about Stefan being caught between his love for Rebecca, a Catholic boy in love with a Jewish girl, and his father, who wanted no part of this and, and was trying right. to keep Stefan away from Rebecca and out of the general strike. Going back to point number one, where stage time's different from screen time, and screen time demands more scenes. How many scenes do we have in the original? Theatrical. Mm. The stage play was was a very traditional style uh, musical where each scene pretty much ended in a song. Right. There was, there's probably That's 18 right. songs in the musical. Yep. The chances are there was probably 18 scenes in the musical originally. Yep. So all the action is happening. It leads up to a song. You're done. Move over to the next <laughs> scene. In for the screenplay version, first thing we're we're breaking those up, and we probably end up with uh, 60 or 70 scenes. Yeah. Uh, but then the second thing that happened was uh, we started breaking up the songs and turning them into scenes as well. So how did right. that happen? Yeah. Sometimes it's just simple. We got a really great actor who is not a singer. <laughs> okay. I have to see the stage show and the movie to know that difference. Some of the long-term fans know that difference very well. Other times it was a philosophical thing where the movie director said, the song ain't working for me. It's mucking with the flow. It's the wrong kind of vibe. And our director, Robert Dottatui, a Canadian, living in Hollywood for the last 25-ish years, mm. and Robert's like, have you ever heard of Hamilton? <laughs> Anachronistic music in a period piece just doesn't matter anymore. In fact, it's kind of cool to do that. Mm. So a lot of the music was so revisioned that some that weren't, just didn't work from an arrangement perspective. So that was that. There was those situations where the heightened level of passion that singing a song brings, especially on screen, was gonna take the scene to a place that it didn't need to be. Some of the scenes just needed to be two people talking. So we came up with this nifty concept of taking the lyrics from the song and using the lyrics as direct dialogue. Look, the hair in my arms goes up just talking about it, but it really, really worked. 
Probably my favorite scene in the movie uh, happens between two soldier characters. Uh, right. It was one of my favorite songs in the in the original stage play. But Robert said, no, for the flow of that part of the story, this has got to be a scene. We reworked it as a scene between the two of them. We have this this beautiful song, gorgeous lyrics that Danny had written, transformed into a scene. It's it's one of the most tightest and, and moving uh, scenes in, in the screenplay. And then remember what happened as an experiment, I thought, well, what if I just use the instrumental of the song that's formally sung as underscore? And it worked. Yeah. yeah. And it ties the scene together beautifully. Yeah. It was, in fact, our first conversation, Robert and I, when we were determining whether he was going to work on the movie. And he loved the script. And he said, but, you know, would you consider an update? What we came to call the diversity draft, would you consider adding some black voices. Immediately I said, yeah. And it just so happened that that was February 1st, 2017, a measure of how long we've been working on this. But that was the first day of Black Lives Matter month. Now I'll leave the rest of the storytelling to Rick. Uh, well, I guess the first thing uh, Robert asked was, well, the, a character that makes immediate sense is uh, we had an Irish maid for the for the wealthy um, couple, the the Andersons, and uh, he said, "What if she's a black maid?" Almost right away, we came across an article about the black population that had moved from Oklahoma uh, in the early uh, 20th century, uh, just that had been living in a in an integrated society essentially in Oklahoma at the time. But when Oklahoma joined the Union in 1907, almost immediately followed lynchings. So the, the racism followed the statehood, and so people were wanting to leave and uh, they came up north, a lot of them to a town in Alberta, but along the way, uh, some came over into Manitoba. So in fact, we did have a, a population. Robert was right just intuitively. Yeah. They were already there. And, and what Robert has said many times, I'm pretty sure there were black people in Winnipeg, but they weren't in the pictures. Yeah. So his phrase about, we got to widen the lens yeah. is just so appropriate. There's some great source material on the net. I'll post it in the comment section of the video. But the long and short of it is Winnipeg had a way bigger black community than we even knew. One of the first unions that was in favor of taking part in the general strike was the All Black Railway Porters Union, which wasn't even officially recognized by the railway porter unions of the time. But just on point of principle, joining the general strike, the section of Winnipeg called Point Douglas was a black community. There's a church that still exists now that existed then. So to those people that said to me at first, well, there weren't any black people in Winnipeg, it's because it was largely overlooked in our history. So it felt good to be able to just put it back in its rightful place in history. And then there was the story of Gabriel the Métis veteran, played in the movie by Gabriel. Gabriel Daniels, an excellent Winnipeg actor. Rick was instrumental in finding some of the research about an area of Winnipeg now occupied by a shopping center. I'll let you tell the story. Uh, Winnipeg is a huge uh, indigenous population. It made sense to put to get indigenous voices into the story, but I was sticking close to what I thought was history and saying, I can't find any evidence because what I knew was that uh, indigenous peoples were not allowed to even leave the reserve. So they weren't allowed in the cities by law. And it took me this long to finally put it together that no, of course, the Métis people were allowed in the city. And so at the same time that we were working on this, a book came out or was about to come out called Rooster Town, which pointed to the the uh, yeah. the shanty town that, that Danny was talking about. And, uh, I, and again, subject to horrible racism, but living together. So... Uh, it took 12 seconds to, to just type that into Google and discover that there was a massive number of, uh, of indigenous First Nations and Métis soldiers in right. World War I. So our Irish soldier, O'Reilly, became our Métis soldier, Gabriel. It turns out it goes both ways. As soon as we finished doing the, uh, oh, yeah. as soon as we finished we doing doing the movie, all those years of rewriting, we got a new production of the play in Winnipeg back on the same stage that Danny put it on in the first place, a huge two thousand seat theater in Winnipeg. And the first thing they asked us was, "Can you bring in some of the uh, changes from the movie?" And so we rewrote and readapted the movie back into True. the stage play. Uh, so it all came around full circle. Very satisfying. And every song came back into it as well. <laughs>
proving yet again musicals are never written just rewritten so there you have it that was a step-by-step -step of our process love to hear your stories put them into the comment section and uh thanks very much to rick for being on musical monday thanks very much if you like this content we have gobs and gobs more in the can and more coming weekly we've got playlists we've got music videos and as always we've got the music from the stan movie musical available on apple music download only thanks for watching